Today's guest, Jay Smith, a self-taught stock market and crypto investor who has climbed to the top of popular trading platform eToro to be one of the most copied traders. He currently manages $150 million worth of funds for strangers. Please like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy. The bigger the potty, the bigger the guests. Right, you, re- you ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready when you are. Yeah, Jay, thank you very much for coming on the podcast, especially um, obviously short notice. I know it's been a, a busy week for everyone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, where'd you start? <laughs> oh, it's absolutely brilliant. I absolutely love it. It's taking me back years. Oh, I can't love it. <laughs> Make sure you're young. <laughs> yeah, be- before we do get into obviously all the, the GameStop drama and stuff, I want to take everyone that's listening on your journey. Um, I have listened, I think, to a little bit. I watched one of your Twitch streams and I think you um I think you kind of touched on it then but I want to get into your background how why you actually started trading because you're one of eToro's biggest well most most copied trader right yeah so I want to know how you actually got to that stage um yeah I mean I I've I've been interested in investing in in trading since uh since a pretty young age um by the time I was like 12 13 I was getting into politics economics um you know stock markets ideology like all of that stuff just you know like a, like a normal teenager trying to build their identity but I guess um I, I delved into it a bit further than most do um and uh yeah I, I pretty quickly came to the conclusion that um you know uh, the world is inherently somewhat unfair and somewhat rigged towards people that have lots of money if you have money then you have more opportunities um so uh i, I figured out that you know I, I need to start saving money as as quickly as i can so that i can really benefit from from the compounding effects of that um so yeah you know i, I dropped out of school at a young age uh, had no qualifications nothing um i was i was pretty good at school pretty smart um in, in maths and stuff but uh, I don't know, it just disagreed with me in some way. And uh, yeah, so I, I kind of went through a pretty pretty strange path. You know, I was working in, in warehouses. Um, I worked for Parcel Force for a while. Found my way into esports because I was at home playing games all the time. Um, so I was a professional gamer for a while. Uh, oh, right. well, which games, sorry? Uh, so, so I played uh, StarCraft, the original StarCraft on PC. Okay. Um, and then Command and & Conquer. And then Trackmania is the game that I had probably the most success in. Um, which I still play today for fun. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah. And then, and then after that, I moved on to work in esports events and, and logistics. Um, and, you know, I, I'd started trading a few years before that uh, on, on my own with a small amount and uh, it grew and uh, eToro, eToro saw my su- success and um, suggested that I become a popular investor and, and I did. <laughs> oh, wow. So, wow. So that's a, a wild ride. So, Possible. What? But why? What actually led you into trading? Because not a lot of people understand or even know what trading or investing even is. And you get told, like, by investors or you know your pension fund, just to start investing in the stock market. You just think, oh, it's a scam. It's a scam. So that's what I used <laughs> to think anyway. So I mean, why did you actually get into trading? Um, well, I think it was uh, kind of. I, I I was always really fascinated with the future, right? Um, there used to be a TV show on on like BBC when I was growing up called Tomorrow's World, um, and you know they were like featuring like you know all this kind of futuristic stuff, talking about like flying cars and stuff, and uh, and you know a lot of it obviously hasn't happened, but a lot of it now has happened, right? We see electric cars and and stuff like that that they were talking about twenty years ago, um, and so like seeing like the the way like the future is going, that was really what inspired me and like looking at disruptive technology and, and what the future holds. Um, and so I thought, you know, how can I, how can I make money out of this? Um, and yeah, that, that led me to the stock markets that led me to, to finding uh, companies that were investing in, and building this stuff and um, were the innovators in these spaces. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. You know, the, the rest of my family are, you know, totally shy, you know, they, they're nothing to do with stocks or, or finances at all. Um, so, you know, I was the black sheep of the family investing in this stuff and telling them that they should be investing in this and investing in that. Uh, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a weird journey. And what, and what were they saying when you obviously started investing in the stock market? What were they saying to you? Uh, they, they, they thought I was gambling, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Like, I, I don't know if they thought I was doing like penny stocks or what. Um, but yeah, they, they thought I was gambling, really, essentially. Um, you know, they, they were telling me all the time to sell. I, I still remember... Um, 
like with with Bitcoin, right? I started buying Bitcoin at around twenty five pounds or so, um, and when it hit three hundred dollars, which was like the first kind of little bubble run it had in in twenty thirteen, right. I still remember my mum being like, "You need to sell it all immediately. Like you've made your money. Stop. Just take your money back out. Like there's no need to go any further." <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, I aged a bit poorly, I guess, but um, yeah, they, they they're just much more conservative, I think. You know. Yeah, no, I think that's the general consensus too. So, have you still got your Bitcoin? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've 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 lost some to scams. I've lost some to exchange hacks. I've lost some to bugs on wallets. Um, you know, a, a lot of people who are in crypto uh, early. First of all, there's a lot of people that say they're in crypto early that really were not. Um, mm. You know, I, I lost my coins. They're on a hard drive somewhere. I, I lost them. Never found them again. You know, in in 2013, the start of 2013. Um, and late 2012, which is when I was getting in, you know, the the Bitcoin Reddit, for example, had something like 50 or 60 thousand people on it. That was it. You know, I, I could probably name you half of the people in the UK that had Bitcoin at the time because right. there was maybe like two, 200 or 300 of us, and that was it. Um, so you know, uh, it's it's a uh, yeah, it's it, it was just a really weird space and um, really the wild west. And you know, like looking looking back at it, like the the taxation situation is just you know ludicrous. Um, uh, you know, I, I I was just giving money away and spending it on all sorts of things. I, I joined a Minecraft server in 2013 and bet on racing pigs on a Minecraft server. You know, <laughs> like the little pigs out of Minecraft. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I was just betting it because you know it was worth like 25 pounds, and I was like, yeah, I'll bet like 0.1 of a Bitcoin. Why not? This is funny. <laughs> um, uh, little did I know, of course, uh, where, where it would go in the future. You know, I was I was always bullish on Bitcoin, but um, even I, I, I don't think really contemplated how far it would run. So. Are you are you still bullish on Bitcoin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, I, I think um, I think at this point it's a risk not to own any Bitcoin. Right. Um, you know, you don't have to own much. A, a lot of people, I think, are you know still confused about how Bitcoin works and stuff. And the fact right. is that it's it's essentially infinitely divisible. You can own such a small fraction. You can invest. You can technically invest a penny into Bitcoin if you wanted to. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's, there's no excuse not to own some. You know, if, if you're thinking about buying a pizza this week, don't buy some Bitcoin. Said so £10 worth of Bitcoin, you know? You never know where that might, might take you in the future. Yeah, that's the, only, that's the only thing I haven't bought in my portfolio. I, haven't, I don't own any, any Bitcoin. Uh, again, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure why. I just, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I'm too late to the pie. I, I, don't, no. I don't know. No? No, I, I don't think so. I don't think okay. so. Not investment advice, but you know. Um. Yeah, yeah. No, none of <laughs> none of what we talk about in here is investment advice. Yeah. Before anyone tries to uh, take us to court. <laughs> so <laughs> you you move on to eToro, right? As you said, you started investing on there. They invited you. How you've got what forty five thousand just shy copiers, right? Yeah. So yeah. what does that equal to under management? So I'm I'm currently I haven't checked it since updated last night, but it's around one hundred and fifty million dollars of uh, assets under management. Yeah, wow, one hundred and fifty million dollars. Just <laughs> so you're all, you you are almost like your own hedge fund. So I'm trying yeah. to understand how the actual copying works from your perspective. I know from my perspective, mm. but can you explain how copying the copying actually works? Yeah, so uh, it's pretty simple, really. Um, I have a portfolio. Um, it's completely transparent on eToro. Anyone can see it. Um, and uh, let's say, for example, I've, I have $100,000 in it. Um, if I open uh, a position, a trade, uh, let's, let's stand buying Tesla with 10% of that portfolio, that would be $10,000 for me. If you press the copy button and you're copying my portfolio, uh, the instant that I make that order to, to execute that trade for 10% of my portfolio, the exact same order is created in your own portfolio. So you will have an order for 10% of what you've set to copy me to do exactly the same. When I close that trade, again, the same thing happens with you. So if you've got $1,000, then it would be $100 of your portfolio going into Tesla. Um, it's, it's really that simple. Um, yeah, it, it just copies what I do. Um, the, cl the clues in the name, I guess. <laughs> that, 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 is su that is such a good system. Why, why, yeah. don't, why don't other people do that or do they? Sorry, do other exchanges offer that? Um, not really. So there's there's a few similar kind of projects here and there, um, but there's really nothing else quite like it. Etoro were the people that basically invented copy trading. Um, right. There are a few other platforms that offer it, but you know that they're, they're really really small. Etoro are the ones that have kind of boomed because of it and, and built this huge community. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think 
realistically, over the next five years or so, we're going to see it rolled out in other places because mm -hmm. I think um, at this point we're seeing on eToro that it's very successful. Um, the, there's a lot of really, really good investors there. And actually a lot of people that have worked at um, you know, investment banks and, and things like that are actually moving to eToro as well because they, they prefer the work-life balance. You know, right. um, you, you, You're kind of trading on your own terms a bit more. Uh, but, but yeah, I think, I think it will be copied by other platforms. So how does that work? Because obviously you're, you've got such a big sum, then surely at a small market cap level, you can potentially move the market, right? Uh, possibly, yeah. Um, so, so eToro have uh, a lot of limitations um, when you start getting to that kind of high AUM range. Um, and it's part of the reason that I'm now copy blocked on eToro. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, if, if I'm investing in like a, a small market cap stock of maybe like a uh, billion dollars, then yeah, potentially I could move the market. So, um, you know, you, you have to be careful because um, you get slippage, right? Which is which is where if you're you're investing such a large amount that the order book isn't deep enough, there's not enough orders there to fill you at the price that you want it at. So the price slips up or down um, depending on you know just to fill that order. Um, so so you have to be aware of that, which is why you know. You've run smaller position sizes, so you kind of ladder your way into a trade gradually um, over the course of a day or a week or whatever it is, and then ladder your way back out again. Um, but that's that's really how you manage it. And then again, eToro has some limitations on things that I can't trade because there's just not the liquidity there um, for me to trade it. When 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 do you think they will lift or will they lift the ban? Um, I don't know. Uh, I have I have literally no idea. They've not told me anything. Um, I think realistically, uh, you know, it's it may be a case of them kind of rebalancing things because I was quite far ahead of the next biggest um, copier. So from their perspective, it's a lot of risk on me. You know, if I were to get hit yeah. by a bus tomorrow, then it hurts their reputation a bit. Um, uh, so, so I think uh, I think that's also part of the reasoning um, behind it. Uh, I, I think it will get lifted. Um, but, you know, I think they're just waiting until um, they've kind of improved their infrastructure behind the scenes to help support that higher AUM um, and, and kind of help support that growth. Because, you know, ex executing 45,000 trades every time I do something for 45,000 different people, you know, that's, that's a big ask on the liquidity mm. provider, on their system, you know, on their staff, uh, the, the, the team that manages risk at eToro. Um, the, there's a lot of moving parts to it. So. Do you, feel, do you feel personally any pressure when you're placing a trade? Uh, I think I've got used to it, really. Um, you know, I, I think uh, there have been a few tricky points. And, and really, when I was first kind of growing, um, like when I hit my first like 300, 400,000 in AUM, that was really when, you know, I had to kind of detach myself from the numbers a bit. Right. Um, and since then, you know, I, I only really look at the, uh, the percentages when I'm doing a trade. You know, it doesn't really cross my mind that, you know, mm -hmm each position is like a million dollars or something. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm buying 1% in this, uh, putting 1% behind this company and I'm expecting them to grow and I'm confident in the trade. So it doesn't really matter how much money I'm putting right. on it, really. Um, yeah, the fundamentals don't change, do they? It's, as you said, yeah. percent based game. What, what, is your, what is your strategy? Like day, long-term, medium? Uh, so, you know, people ask, eToro ask me this actually. <laughs> and, and you don't um, know? <laughs> and, well, no, not really. Um, it's, uh, it sounds, it sounds ludicrous, right? But it's, it's, uh, it's a real hybrid strategy, right? So, um, right. I mean, the, the two kind of core schools in, of thought in, in investing is like growth investing and value investing, right? So the value investor goes for things like GameStop. Um, mm. you know, people, people who are buying GameStop in 2019 and early 2020, um, those, those were value investors. They're looking at it and they're saying, even if they went bankrupt, all of the stores they own is worth more money than the company right now. So right. I'm going to get my money back at the worst case scenario. Um, and th that's what value investors look for. Whereas growth investors are the people that are looking at stuff like Tesla and, and you know, Neo and all of these kind of more trendy companies that are really like booming and just trying to expand at like a rapid pace. Um, and that's, that's where I sit. Um, beyond that, you've then got like, you know, active management or, or passive management. Um, so passive is someone that's a buy and hold investor. They wait for a long time before they do anything. Um, and active is someone that's like, you know, chopping and changing and, and moving things around depending on how the market's looking. Um, so that's where I sit. Um, so yeah, I, I guess, uh, you know, I'm a growth growth investor that, that is uh, actively managing the portfolio. Sometimes I'll do day trades. Sometimes I'll, you know, hold trades for three or four weeks. Sometimes I'll hold it for a year. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's how I do it, I guess. And, and and how important is the sale versus the buy? Obviously, you can time the sale and the buy, right? So yeah, um, I I actually know what I actually don't focus on it that much. Um, you know, I, I, most people trade uh, kind of place orders um, 
I, I actually prefer just um, buying at the market rate, whatever the current market is doing. So a lot of people go and look at a chart and then say, right, I think it's going to drop down to here. I'm going to buy in here. I'll go look at a chart and I'll say, yeah, close enough. You know, um, because because it doesn't matter if you're going, Same. if you're expecting 20 or 30% growth over the next, you know, six months, for example, um, then it really doesn't matter if you're, you know, half a percent or higher or lower um, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, yeah. No, I totally agree on that. It's the exact same thing I was saying the other day. Like my my, my um, cousin was saying to me, he was placing his first ever trades in into some obviously nice companies, Tesla, uh, Comcast, Disney, and and I was saying, he, and he's talking to all his other friends, and you, you know what they're saying to each other now at the moment. You should you should uh, you shouldn't set it to open because it's going to open lower, and I'm like, well, it could also open higher, so it's irrelevant, right? And in the grand scheme of things, when you're investing over the space of 10, 12, 14 years or whatever it is, then does it really matter if it opens an extra two dollars lower or, or above? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so exactly. crazy, yeah. so crazy. So what what are you generally looking for when you're investing? Obviously, again, it's a broad question. So if you could just mm. highlight maybe the top three things. Yeah, so I think um, probably the, the the main thing is. Uh, innovation right that could be innovation of a business model maybe uh like like peloton for example is a good example of that right like they've taken the concept of a gym that said let's do it at home and let's charge people a subscription for me the same way gyms do um, right you know that, that's an interesting business model um and something new that nobody else has done same as netflix um the other thing is new markets as well you know looking at where the future is going right so evs was a big thing to start investing in four or five years ago. I think that hydrogen is a big thing to be investing in now. Um, or veganism, vegan food, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, so, so looking at future trends. Um, and then I guess the last thing really is, uh, is probably actually looking back at those value plays. Even though I'm a growth investor, at the end of the day, if I can find a company that I think uh, really, when you look at their balance sheet, is really, really healthy um, and, and forgotten, um, in, in many cases, people just, you know, they're too focused on all this kind of trendy stuff going on, all the, all the meme stocks, as people call them. Mm. Um, then, then you can actually find some real gems in places that people just aren't looking at because it's not a cool industry. Uh, so, so those are like the three kind of, um, the three core things I'd, I'd pick out, I guess. Okay. And what was, the, what was the first ever trade you did? Um, I actually think the first trade I ever did was, was Nokia. Um, possibly, okay. or it might have it might have been um, Arm Holdings, which is uh, like a processor company. They were making um, mobile phone chips. This back when Android was being released and stuff. Um, so yeah, that that was those those were like the first two I have memory of, really. I actually took a position recently in Nokia after talking to uh, Rob Reynolds, and he was talking yeah. about Nokia, and I was thinking. Nokia. I was thinking not Nokia, like from Nokia. <laughs> and then I, I did a bit of research and he's totally right. I mean, yeah. the fundamentals are there. The balance sheet looks great. So they're, they're playing on what, 5G and 6G? So Yeah, yeah. And and they've, uh, you know, Nokia have got a really big patent portfolio as well. That's mm. the other thing. Um, people always undervalue that. But Nokia has always been one of these companies that's, um, that seems to like be forgotten by people. You know, it's a perfect example of what I was just talking about, right? It's not a trendy company. You don't think Nokia, wow, what a cool investment. You know, I'm changing the world. You know, it's it's you know they make uh, they make networking equipment essentially now, and 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 that's it. Um, so it's it's not it's not super trendy. But as you say, like when you when you dig into the balance sheet, you think actually this is a, a pretty solid company. Yeah, and I think they've recently um, have got the contract to build a tower on the moon for NASA, right? Really? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So I'm pretty sure they got the yeah. yeah. That's, that sounds that sounds wild. Yeah, so I think it's like a four, <laughs> maybe it's fourteen million. Yeah. Wow. So pretty cool. Like, it's not maybe huge. they are a cool company after all. Wow. <laughs> Let's see what happens. So you know, your do you have a personal portfolio that is different to your eToro portfolio? Um, no, not really. Uh, I, I have cryptocurrencies outside of eToro, but right. everything else really is um, is on eToro at the moment. Um, I, I don't really see that much of a, a reason to change. I think it, it just com complicates things. You know, if you're trying to manage two different portfolios with different strategies and risk, different like risk appetites, um, it just makes things more difficult. So, uh, yeah, I prefer to just you know stick to eToro. There's a few instruments and, and stuff that I'd like to trade that they don't have, um, but uh, you know. It's it's nothing uh, nothing that I'm really too concerned about. Uh, yeah, are you not? Ca do, don't don't they limit the rips the the risk score? Yes, they do. They so, limit the risk score to six. Yeah. Does that affect you in any way? 
Um, not really. Uh, there have been moments in time where it has in the past, um, you know, like maybe a few days or something I've been over it. Or if I've been like, you know, super, super bullish on a company and I decide that, you know, they're going to have a really good earnings um, earnings call or something, uh, I'm expecting them to beat their expectations and maybe I'll open some leverage trades on them and ramp up to like 10% of my portfolio or something, which is quite a, quite a lot. Um, but, you know, if, if you're doing that at a time when the market is volatile, then yeah, maybe you could ho- head over that risk score of six. But um, for the most part, I actually sit around five. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not too concerned with it. Right. And what 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 gains did you get last year, 2020? And obviously, I know 2020 is an anomaly. I think you've actually said, um, was it, it might have been in your Twitch stream again, that you actually predicted that it was going to be, obviously, the market crash with the COVID, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that was that was back in uh, in February kind of time, January February. So um, I mean, it's it's interesting. I was actually tweeting with the CEO of Etoro um, in February, asking him uh, for some more advice on on value stocks um, right. because you know he's he's like an investor as well. You know, he's he's passionate about the markets and looks at stuff. So and value investing isn't really my my kind of my my forte, like my home turf. Um, mm. So, you know, I, I, I expected that the COVID crash was going to come um, and, and come pretty hard. And this, this was back when there were maybe, you know, 50 or 60 cases in China. Um, and so, yeah, I, I decided that, you know, I need to move away from growth stocks because they're inherently much more volatile, much more risky, um, and move towards some of the safer stuff that just pays dividends um, and is in a good position to, to go through this crisis, right? Um, so, yeah, I was, I was actually asking him for advice on, on where to go. Um, it was a pretty, pretty wild time, you know. I had to make some hard decisions on, on what to cut from the portfolio, um, cutting like 50, 60% of positions, regardless if they're in a profit or a loss, you know. You just kind of have to accept that, you know, if you have conviction in 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 your prediction, then you you need to just go for it. Uh, so yeah, that's that's what I did, and and I, I called the top. You know, okay, not not great, um, and the same with the bottom. It's it's very hard to time things perfectly, mm. but you know, really, my goal was to just you know keep flat compared to compared to the market, and that's basically what I achieved. So uh, I was I was really happy with it. And what 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 percent did you end up on for twenty twenty? Uh, 2020, I think, was 103.5% um, profit, which is wow. uh, r- roughly double the NASDAQ. Um, so, yeah, it was it was a good year for me. Wow. And my copies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How about January this year? I, know, I saw a post today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, up 7% seven, 7 or so uh, for January. Pretty good. Um, Exclu- not, not great. Excluding the game stuff, right? Yeah, I, so, so I, I specified that in a tweet afterwards, actually, because I mean, and, and actually, you know, something else I point out for 2020 as well is that, you know, that was without trading uh, Tesla and without Neo being a major part of my portfolio. A lot of the really um, big hype stocks, which I think are overvalued. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's not that I'm against the, the GameStop movement um, in terms of why I didn't trade it. It's, it's more that, you know, when I look at the downside risk and the upside risk, um, and I actually look at the fundamentals behind it, you know, clearly it's a move that's detached from the fundamentals, right? It's about something else. But I can't afford to risk, um, you know, a million dollars of other people's money on that. Um, you know, I can make good gains elsewhere. You don't always have to go for whatever the biggest, shiniest gain is, you know. Um, as long as you're beating the market, then that's good in my opinion. Absolutely. No, I totally agree. Especially when, you, when it's... Um... The amounts of two, three, four hundred dollars. I mean, realistically, the only way yeah. it's all it could go up, but you got more down, you got more chance of it obviously going down. Yeah, yeah. I got in a um I couldn't resist again AMC. I didn't I didn't I didn't invest in game because again I was too late, but um I'm with HSBC Private and they can trade like v- pretty early to be fair. Um mm. so I invested, I just thought I'd throw five hundred thousand. <laughs> just, <laughs> just just casual, casual five hundred K yeah, stick it well, in. It, it was just, it was to be fair, the only reason I did it is just to, just because I knew it was a historic moment and I wanted to be involved in that. It, it, it sometimes, you know, it, it, it brings, it just brings back a little nostalgia, like when you're going back in the day and you think back, I thought, I want to be a part of this. So, but I actually yeah. got in quite early. So I invested it at $8 and then I, I sold half of the investment at maybe, I think it was about $15 or just shy. And then I sold uh, the rest of the, position uh yesterday i believe it was or the day before at um around 17 so yeah ended, ended so up with a nice return yeah <laughs> end, 
ended up with a nice return. But again, even me, I no, I'm not throwing any more than 0.34% of my portfolio yeah. at something like this. I wouldn't ever risk, but you've got you've got guys out there, people listening right now that are throwing their whole stimulus check or they're throwing their old their, their mom's yeah. bank card on it. And it's just completely ridiculous. If you're going to again throw anything on something like this, it needs to be a very small portion of your portfolio and you need to know when to sell. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, you've just got to control the greed, right? It's it's very easy after you've gone up 100% to think, oh, there, there could be another 100% still to right. go, you know? It, the same thing happened with GameStop, you know? First, the target was $100, and then it was $200, and that was $400, and, you know, people talking about $1,000, and you're just thinking, like, you know, at what point are you, are you going to get out of this? Um, even if you're a fan of the movement, right? Even if, if you put that money in thinking, you know what, I don't care if I lose this. I just want to kind of prove a point and be part of history. Right. Um, there's nothing wrong with taking, you know, a tiny bit of percent of that back, getting back your initial investment even, um, you know, uh, you've just got to, you've just got to be wary of the fact that, you know, um, it does play on your emotions when you start seeing those numbers go up. Um, and yeah, you, 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 I guess you don't want to see the result of it if it goes back down, right? Because that also will play on your emotions and uh, Absolutely. You, you don't want to be kicking yourself. And the thing is, it always happens. It's, this is the standard greed that the whole human mentality falls into. Okay. Uh, a game, for example, has gone to five hundred dollars. What is the next one? What? And then everyone that's on this game movement starts spreading their risk elsewhere to make gains. So it's just not possible for all those things. Obviously, with all those different market caps, and what people also again fail to understand with a game, it had a, obviously a low flow, low market cap. It was what it was overshorted, right? Yeah. And these other stocks just don't have that. It was the perfect scenario, right, for game to actually become that big. Yeah, uh, I, and you see. Um... I mean, like the whole Wall Street bets thing is is you know interesting, right? I've I've right. been a member of Wall Street bets, kind of lurking around that forum for probably, I don't know, maybe like five, six, seven years. Um, so so you know, I'm I'm familiar with their, their kind of uh, what what they do. And the thing about Wall Street bets is that it's a community that actually is full of really really good investors. Um, they're just a bit keen, <laughs> you know. So when when they find something they like, and and they'll spend you know days and weeks researching this stuff to find a, find a good investment. The same as I would, the same as uh, Rob, who was on, on your podcast before would. Um, and, and then them, what they do is they go and leverage it like five times and stick their entire balance into it, right? <laughs> um, and and that's, that's what kind of makes them the, the, uh, the degens, as they would call it, the degenerates. Um, but, uh, but they were really good investors. And, and what's happened since, um, since this GameStop thing has kind of taken off is that uh, it's just... It's been flooded with opportunists um, and it's been flooded with scammers to some extent, right? You're getting people that are, that are purposefully creating these things, trying to pump stocks that they maybe already own. Um, you know, they're, they're currently banning posts um, from a lot of accounts that have been inactive for two or three years that they think have, have been bought by organizations to just mm. try and, you know, pump different <laughs> stocks. Um, you, you've got to be careful with this stuff. Like you, you shouldn't really be taking advice from anyone else. You, you need to be doing your own research um, or, or, or finding someone that you really, really trust. Um, and, and I think that there's a lot of people that have joined it that are basically just trying to create these pump and dump scenarios um, and pump up these things that really are not worth the money. And they don't have, as you say, the same situation as GameStop. They aren't shorted, um, naked shorted by, by more than the number of shares that are actually floating, right? Um, so it's, uh, you know, GameStop, as you say, was a pretty unique scenario. And I think uh, everyone's trying to find this next thing. What's the next GameStop? And in reality, there might not be a next GameStop. Um, and, and you have to be thinking about that. And you have to really be thinking about, you know, sensible expectations on, on what you're likely to get from the markets. What would be your advice to guys that are listening now that actually own GameStop and own AMC stock and own all these other meme stocks? Um, but it depends why they're doing it, right? I mean, I, I support the movement. I support this idea of, of proving a point and, and showing that, you know, naked shorting was something that was actually banned after 2008, 2009 financial crisis um, because it, you know, exacerbated the problem. Um, and and yet we still have it. It still exists. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the reasons for it still existing are a bit more complex, but uh, it's still there and it needs to be fixed because if it's not fixed, then, you know, theoretically, if enough people just kept piling into GameStop, it could go on forever. Right. You know, it could, it could go up to $2,000, $3,000. It could do something wild if, if everyone jumped on it. Um, but it would also probably bring down the market at the same time, right? And uh, so right. you've got to weigh up the, the, 
the pros and cons of it. I think the point has been proven now. So, uh, you know, even if you are someone that got into it for, for these ideological reasons of trying to prove this point, um, and, you know, put, put your finger up to the man or, or whatever it is. Um, the suits? I, I would, yeah, exactly. The suits, yeah. yeah. I would probably urge people to take some profits. Um, you know, and, and if you're saying a loss, you know, you've got to be you've got to be sensible about it, right? Like just because you've lost uh let's say ninety percent, that doesn't mean that there isn't still ninety-nine percent more that you can lose, right? There's always ninety-nine percent downside left. Right. So uh, you know, be wary of that and think, you know, maybe maybe you should take that loss that's fifty percent or whatever and uh, kind of move on. Do you think there's gonna be any regulation coming from this whole situation? Um, it's it's hard to say. It's really hard to say. Um I think uh, I think that there's clearly stuff that needs to change. Um, and I do think that most of it is around naked shorting. Um, I think that's actually the thing that's most likely to be tackled after this um, and, and hedge funds, uh, you know, over shorting companies. Um, in terms of like retail investors, I think realistically, it's, it's very likely to end up in more stringent tests before people can start investing. Um, and it, it may well be a case that we start losing things like leverage um, for, for retail traders. Um, I'm not sure if that's necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. Um, you know, I, I've seen a lot of people that know absolutely nothing and they're, they're buying options and they're buying leverage without mm -hmm. a clue what they're doing. You know, mm -hmm. they haven't got, they don't understand what it is. Um, I see it all the time, actually, even on eToro where I'm trading, right? There are people that are making posts saying, you know, I press the sell button on, e on, on GameStop and it hasn't closed my position. What, what's going on? And I'm like, what you've done is you've just opened a short. You know, um, <laughs> those are different things. Um, right. Sell doesn't mean close your position. Close means close your position. Um, and so, yeah, I think some regulation could actually be beneficial. But, uh, you know, realistically, this entire thing is a good thing, right? It's at the end of the day, this has taught a lot of people a lot of things very quickly about how markets work um, yeah. and how they can build wealth for themselves um, sustainably. Um, and even the people that lost money hopefully have learned some lessons from it mm. um, and, and can, you know, go on to, to, do, to, to do well in the markets going forward. Yeah, I agree. There's a lot of smart pe smart investors out there that people can listen to and do their research on and start to kind of look at the mindset on how they're investing. And for sure, there's going to be a lot of people that lose money. There's going to be a lot of people that make money. And I think, as you said, if they can take that profit they've made and start investing it for the long term, because these 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 type of opportunities like game just don't come around. So just, as you move forward, try not to keep chasing them. That's That is my only bad part about this whole situation is people could get addicted to the fact of 100, 200, 300% and, you know, 3% gain over a month or two months or three months or even a year isn't going to be attractive anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, you've got to think about how sustainable it is as well, because even if, if, if you start with a thousand dollars, right. And then you make a thousand percent and then you go and find another trade and you make a thousand percent and you f go find a third one. Let's say you get lucky three times in a row and you make a thousand percent three times that thousand dollars you started with is now like 10, $10 million or something, probably more. Um, and, and when you start getting up to that kind of size, you start realizing that actually you can't even get into those opportunities anymore because you'll move the market. Um, Absolutely. And and so you know you've you've got to be sensible with with what you're looking at, right? These courses that go around tell you you can you can earn one percent a day by day trading, right? If you did that for a whole year, you would earn more money than exists in the entire world. Like it's it's you know it's utterly ludicrous. Um, so some of the claims that uh, these people make, and and you've just got to set realistic expectations. You know your benchmark should be the Nasdaq or the S and P, the underlying stock mm. markets, right? The big indices or the FTSE if you're in the UK and you're trading UK stuff, right? Um, those those are what you should be aiming to be. If you're beating that, then you're basically beating like 99% of people out there. Um, and, and that's good, right? And you should be happy about that because if you do that for 10 years, you do that for a decade, you're sorted. You know. Absolutely. The aim is to keep money, not lose it, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the aim is to keep money, not lose well, it. It's Warren Buffett's first rule is uh, don't lose money. <laughs> yeah. Don't lose money. That's what he says. Yeah. What What are your thoughts on this this silver squeeze? Um, I don't think it's really a uh, squeeze. I don't right. think that silver is really that heavily shorted. Um, I suspect actually that quite probably it's um, a lot of hedge funds have uh, gone and created accounts on Reddit. Um, because silver, silver is uh, used as a, a hedge by a lot of uh, a lot of investors, especially like institutions and stuff. Um, and it's used a lot in industry and stuff. And you know, I, I do think silver was actually a little bit undervalued. Um, but 
uh, at the same time, you know, again, it comes down to you shouldn't be following other people's recommendations on it. You know, it's just because someone says it's a short squeeze. Like, have you actually Googled it? Have you actually checked? Mm. You know, I think most people just blindly go into it and, and believe what these people are saying um, without really doing the research. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be going into it. Yeah, I agree. What, um, what was your whole, what's your whole thoughts on that, the whole entire Robin Hood situation and how they actually kind of decided to stop people from, from buying only selling? Yeah, uh, so eToro actually did this as well. Um, right. for, for about an hour, eToro did it. And, and actually, um, you know, I, I make this point a lot. I go, I, I go through Reddit for some reason. I, <laughs> apparently, I don't value my time. Just responding to all of these people who are saying, oh, why have they done this? This is illegal. This is terrible. And I'm like, have you read the terms and conditions that you agreed to when you joined the platform? And the answer is always no. Um, or, or they just lie and they say, it doesn't matter, it's illegal. Uh, right. um, but, but ultimately, like, this is a, a complex issue, right? And, and all of these exchanges, like this, this is a once in a lifetime thing, right? You've mm. got millions of people around the world joining these platforms, trying to buy GameStop and other similar stops, AMC, Nokia, BlackBerry, um, et cetera. And when they do that, these these brokers, they they aren't the people that are actually doing the trading, right? They have a partner that they work with, like a clearinghouse or an investment bank. It, it could be a range of people even. Um, and those are the people that are actually executing the trades for them. And so they're going to those people and saying, hey, we want to execute all of these trades. Um, and they send them a bunch of money and, and in exchange, they do the trading for them right. and then give them the shares back. And what was happening was that with people were using a lot of leverage, so there are a lot of um, trades being bought with leverage. And so the brokers were having to deposit huge amounts of money, like billions and billions of dollars into these clearing houses. And that actually creates a risk for the brokerage, right? If you, if you put like 50% of your balance sheet to a brokerage to execute some trades, even if it's only going to be there for like a day while they're doing this, um, you know, if that, bro if that trading house goes bankrupt, um, you're in big trouble. You've just lost all of your customers' funds. Um, and that was part of the problem, right? So these, the, you have all of these people like essentially DDoSing the market, right? Yeah. Everyone's trying to get in. Um, and they just didn't have the capacity to process it all. Um, so, so the, the clearinghouses were under huge pressure to try and execute all of these trades for all of these different people who want it. Um, at the same time, all of the brokerages are thinking, wow, we've got too much money in one place. Like we're at risk of, of if something goes wrong, like our entire company is at risk, you know, hundreds of people's jobs and, and all of our copiers and investors' uh, money, you know, could, could be on the line. So I think it was genuinely taken um, the decisions were taken for good reasons. Uh, whether or not they were communicated in a good way um, and whether or not it was communicated this kind of thing can happen um, to, to retail investors in a good way, that remains to be seen, right? I, I think that eToro did an okay job. I think Robin Hood did a terrible job. Terrible like, they, job. They, weren't, they, they weren't even honest about what it was, you know? Um, right. only, only yesterday on Elon Musk's um, clubhouse did they actually admit that it was a liquidity problem. Right. So, but he still didn't apologize. He's still yet no. to apologize to, to, to everyone that he kind of upset. But I totally agree. And I think people are overlooking that point that you made, that they are doing, they were doing it, whether or not Citadel or whoever else was involved, they were still doing it to protect your own capital. Mm. If they go yeah. bankrupt, you're invested in these companies, all these, you will lose money, right? So, yeah. Yeah. but communication definitely remains to <laughs> still not yeah. be said. Yeah. Which is uh, a little bit annoying, but so... <laughs> Did you, did you do any trades, obviously, in the volatility last week? Uh, I did loads of trades. <laughs> and, and how did you do? Um, I mean, I did okay. So I, I wasn't really trading any of the, the really hype stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure it was a, an okay week for me. And it was a pretty brutal, brutal week, really. Um, that, that closure really changed the market of uh, the mood of the market. So, um, and, and one thing that I actually noticed, and, and genuinely, so I actually considered opening a positioning in GameStop a lot right. um, uh, mid, midway through that week because I kind of realized that it was uh, kind of reverse correlated to the markets. Um, so the markets had actually started to really sink because of the fact that these big funds were starting to close their other long positions to cover their shorts. Um, they needed that money to keep those shorts open. Mm. So they were closing all of all of their other stocks everywhere. And the rest, and, and not only that, but you had retail investors doing the same, right? All, all right. me and you and everyone else were thinking, wow, why am I trading this thing and earning like 3% when I could trade this thing and earn 300%? Um, mm. And so you had all of this kind of money was being sucked into it. And so everything else was sinking in value. Um, 
So it was it was difficult training conditions, and and you know most of what I was really doing was actually trying to uh, hedge against that, and and you know bet on those other markets going down, right? Um, while while the GameStop situation was happening. Um, so yeah, pretty pretty wild situation. <laughs> can you can, can can you can you share potentially um, how much you were up last week? Um, you know, I don't even know if I've got that available. Uh, okay, let me have a look. Uh, I can tell you the last seven days. Go on, if, yeah. if you want. Uh, oh, last, no, I, know, I know people love figures, so let's give them. It's, honestly, it's, it's actually pretty underwhelming. Um, the last seven days was minus one point three percent. Right, so there you go. So I but, actually lost lost money. Oh, and that was day trading, right? Uh, well, so so that's the overall balance of the portfolio. Uh, okay. Um, in in terms of like positions closed that week, uh, if I have a look, roughly. Um, I mean, yeah, I closed some long positions on Ethereum and stuff, hundred uh, percent profit. So, <laughs> nice. um, yeah, I, I don't know, probably, probably like one or two percent in terms of realized profits. Right, closed, closed trades for that week. Well, yeah. Well, f- well, Friday was a was a bit of a terrible day, right, for the markets. Yeah, Friday was awful. Absolutely last, awful. Last yeah. trading day of the month, and re- yeah. Re- re- um, yeah, it it was. It was a bit of a <laughs> bit of a bloodbath. But but you know, if you go and look at the chart of the the Nasdaq or or the S and P, you'll actually see that we've had these these sell offs like almost every at the end of like the past you know every two weeks we've had a sell off like this. Almost the exact same percentage on the chart. You can go and open a candlestick chart and you'll see the same big red candle right. um, on on a daily chart. And so yeah, if for me it was just another opportunity to kind of double down on the stuff that I like and and you know deploy a bit more capital and um, and you know hopefully benefit from from things recovering and this week that's that's the way it's going yeah true i only really try and buy on red days because i'm not going to buy on a green day because obviously i'm losing out a little bit there but i, I just i just try and make that the generally the mentality just yeah. always buying red days because less people are buying and i just i don't know i feel like it it gives me that edge even though it doesn't really <laughs> <laughs> yeah no no i mean it's 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 generally it's pretty pretty decent advice you know um but yeah, it, it, the the only danger with it comes is if you wait too long for a red day, because then then you actually end up missing out on more of the rally before. So yeah, absolutely. If the conviction's there, well, I'll take it. But if I've already invested in a company uh, and it yeah. takes a yeah, big exactly. hit, then I'll, as you said, I'm up. we're there. What? Where do you see the rest of 2021 going? I just see for me at the at this moment in time, I'm a little bit worried in the sense of. There's so much volatility. Everyone's getting their stimulus checks. And I just worry when when stimulus stops and everyone starts to get back to work and they stop spending their money because everyone's sat in at the moment. Everyone's on Twitter. No one wants to miss out on the markets. And there's a lot of people pumping money into the markets. I just worry that we're going to see a little bit of a decline in some tech stocks. Obviously, the recovery players like Boeing and stuff are probably going to fly. But I just, I'm a little bit worried in that sense. Yeah. Um... Uh, I think we're in for another year like 2020, to be honest. It's going to be volatile. It's going to be tricky. There's going to be moments when the recovery stocks are booming and there's going to be moments when the stay-at-home stocks are booming. Um, and, you know, everything in between. Uh, so I think I think realistically, you know, the best approach is to have a, is to have a mix, right? Yeah. Um, and if you go and look at my portfolio, you'll see that I've got a mix. I've got companies like, uh, like Siemens, right, who make everything under the sun pretty much um <laughs> pretty pretty kind of boring company really when you think about what they do um but you know they they they're low growth they're not super volatile and you know they they're slow and steady and at the same time i've got stuff like uh, like peloton which is you know um still pretty much a hyped hyped up stock and and you know they they're banking on like insane growth and they're banking on um the the lockdowns and stuff lasting longer because that benefits them right um but by making, you know, the, the more diversified you are, the, the safer you are, and, and the, the more smooth that kind of upwards trajectory will be. Um, it just means that you're sacrificing potentially a little bit of profit um, for that. So it, it's all about your risk appetite, you know? There's a good saying for that, what you just said. Uh, concentration builds wealth, diversification preserves wealth. Yeah, yeah, That's exactly. I, I like that one. It's a good phrase. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. I, to be fair, I actually heard someone else say it on a different podcast. And I, thought I'd, I thought there'd be a yeah, perfect that's, that's time to mine. bring it into here. <laughs> that is now mine. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, so what advice would you, again, I'm just trying to pick you, but what, what advice would you give to any new investors coming into the market that, again, need to think long term as much as possible, try and put everything back and just try and think long term? What's the best advice you, you would give people? Yeah, so I think the first thing is to invest in sectors that you understand, right? If you work at a parcel delivery company, you understand that business and you understand the demands that there might have been because of because of lockdowns, because of, you know, uh, people doing online shopping, whatever. You're going to understand that way better than an analyst on Wall Street will. 
Um, and th- and that's a fact, right? Uh, right? Like, you know, that that's that's where I started. That's how I started investing. Um, and you, you can have real conviction in, in your plays in that space, right? You have decent decent knowledge of the industry. You know if a competitor is struggling or not. You know if there's like a new product that's coming out. If you work for, uh, you know, a mobile phone company, you're going to know which new models are coming out and which, you know, new technology is coming out. You're going to know that the camera for this phone is made by Sony and maybe you're going to go and invest in Sony as a result. Um, so, so that's the first thing, right? Invest in the sector that you know and you understand, to, to begin with at least. Um, the second thing uh, that I would probably recommend to people is um, don't feel like you have to get invested immediately. Um, you can take your time, right? Do some really small trades uh, to start with. Just learn what spread is. Learn uh, how to close a trade quickly if you need to. Learn your way around the platform that you've decided to use. Um, and, and you know the tools at your disposal. Learn, learn about how to read a candlestick chart. Um, you can do all of this stuff for free. Um, and it just takes, you know, like a, a weekend or something, sitting down and kind of uh, looking around and, and, you know, studying how these things work. Um, and yeah, you don't have to put money in straight away. You can you can use fake money. Most websites actually have, uh, have right. uh, you know, virtual accounts where you can trade with uh, fake money and, and see how you do for a bit. Uh, yeah. And then when you feel ready, you can start start investing and start well, long term. That's the last thing. Start yeah. long term investing. Don't try and day trade. It's difficult. Yeah. So yeah, I think a good a good a good way of just thinking is what are you going to be using in the next five years? Are you still going to be using your Apple MacBook? Right. Yeah. yeah. Are you still going to be using your, I don't know, your again your Apple phones? Another one's just there in your face. So simple things like that. Um what what investment apps would you say are the best? Obviously, I know you use eToro. What what other ones are out there that are good? So uh in, in terms of like exchanges or exchange, in terms of like tools? Ex- ex- exchanges, so we're going to tools after. Yeah, uh so it it depends where you're from. I'm assuming most of your listeners are from the UK. So uh, you know, trading two one two, eToro plus five hundred, those are like the the most accessible ones um right. and, and cheapest ones. Right. So, you know, take take a look at them. Um, you know, you can create an account for all of them and have a look around before you really decide which one you're gonna use. Um look on YouTube, there's good comparison videos. Um, because they're all good at different things, um, and yeah, then then the side that way, um, yeah. And uh, what what type of research materials and tools websites do you use? Yeah, uh, so for charts, I use TradingView.com. It's pretty much become like industry standard at this moment. At this time, um, you can use it for free. Uh, the free version is still pretty good. Um, especially for a beginner. You really don't need to pay for the, the premium version. Uh, another website that's free to use uh, is seekingalpha.com. That's got lots of articles about different stocks that you might want to invest in. Um, and you can just go and read other people's opinions on it. It gives you a good idea on how people value a company and, right. and what other investors are looking at. Um, and then I guess the, the last one is investopedia.com, if you, especially if you're new. Um, investopedia.com basically is a Wikipedia for investing. If you've heard a term that if you don't know what short selling is, if you don't know what naked shorting is, you can go on there and you can type it in and it'll give you a definition. Um, really short and succinct and straight to the point. Uh, brilliant for anyone who's learning. Any term you don't understand, go on Investopedia and Google it and you'll find, you'll find what it is. Yeah, I also like her as well. And again, I say to people, if you, if you, again, if you don't know anything about invest in or you're just thinking of a company just go straight onto youtube and just look at the stock yeah. analysis and look at 10 yeah. different people's stock analysis they pretty much cover a lot of things for you then you can go and have a look and look at things and, and see what you think again that's yeah. the most simplest way you know uh, i i actually agree entirely so I'm, I'm one of these people that's quite a kind of visual learner i don't like reading mm. stuff um so i i actually watch a lot of stuff on on youtube i also watch a lot of bloomberg tv as well um but like robert who you had on here before i've watched every single one of his videos even if there's stuff I don't invest in, um, you know, it's it's just good knowledge and it's good to see how he's thinking about it and if he spotted something that I haven't. Um, and and you know, the, as 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 you said, like there's just so so many people on YouTube that are that are doing this now. Um, the only thing is, obviously, you know, again, be careful. Do your own research as well. Don't just rely on this. But it is a very useful, quick glimpse at why people um, might be long or short on a different uh, investment. Yeah, and as you said as well, read comments because some well, a lot of people do have some really good comments. A lot are kind of pointless mm. and a little bit silly, but some people do have really good comments. And I know on Seeking Alpha, for example, you can follow you can follow different people on there that make good comments, and you can actually track yeah, their yeah. comments. Yeah, the comment section is as good as the articles actually on Seeking Alpha. I would say. 
Yeah, for sure. Because you can read an article and it can sound very biased and it can automatically think, oh, I want to invest in that company. And you read the comments and someone's put a counter argument straight in there and yeah. they're like, oh, great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, <laughs> yeah. As, as, as I said, you know, uh, it's, it's one of the best ways to kind of get an insight on how people are looking at these stocks and what they think are the things that are driving their growth or their profits going forward. Yeah. I know, I know you touched on the future trends, obviously hydrogen. Is there anything else that you feel like is a, is a thing to look at for the future? Uh, millions, millions. Right. And, and this, this has kind of always been my focus, right? As I said near the start, you know, I was always like super fascinated by the future and, and what's coming next. Um, I think if you're in the UK, it's impossible to ignore the vegan food movement. And there are yeah. some big, big IPOs coming up soon um, in, in that space. We've got things like Beyond Meat that people know about um, and, and they've been doing really well. But um, things like uh, oat milk and stuff like that, um, Oatly, the company, yeah. they, they should be IPOing this year. Um, I've actually got that in my fridge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I love oat milk. It's, it's great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I think that's a, a really interesting trend. And, and the thing is, right, if you're from the UK especially, you may look at this and think, oh, maybe I've missed the boat, right? Like you go to the supermarket and there's a whole aisle of like vegan food now. Um, and you think, ah, oh, there's probably no opportunities left, right? But you go and speak to someone who lives in Spain or someone who lives in uh, Portugal or someone who lives in uh, America or Canada, and they have still got nothing, right? Mm -hmm. They've got the Beyond Meat products and that's it. So mm -hmm. there is still huge potential for this market to grow. Um, 3D printing. 3D printing was like a big thing that everyone was fascinated about five years ago, and then nothing happened. 3D printing stocks right now are incredibly well valued, I think. Um, and and like 3D printing in itself is like just a, a big deal, right? We're going to be 3, 3D printing car chassis. We're going to be 3D printing household objects. We're going to be 3D printing buildings. Um, that That's a really cool industry. Uh, I mean, I, I could probably rattle off like 20. So I, I'll, I'll leave you with those two unless you want more. Um, uh yeah, go on. Give, give us a few more because I'm actually writing them down myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, vertical farming. Um, so okay. the, the idea of um, building farms in cities. Uh, so city farms and vertical farming. Uh, related to that, you've actually got... Um, um, Sorry, uh, how, how, how does vertical farming work in cities? So basically, it's, it's building farms inside buildings. Um, that's right. essentially what vertical farming is. Um, and uh, the, the, it's designed so you don't really use anything like as much land and stuff. It's really valuable in, in countries that don't have much real estate, right? So like Singapore, right? Singapore is like a little city state that's just got no land left. Right. So they, ha they, they import something around 90% of their food. Um, and vertical farming gives countries like that the ability to actually um, increase their food security. Um, and start growing things like tomatoes and stuff in their own country inside a building. Um, and, and it uses way less water. You don't have to worry about pesticides. So you can do like fully organic. Like um, it's, it's really, really interesting, um, that space generally. Uh, there's not many stocks that really give you good exposure to that yet, but it's, it's just one of these things that you kind of want to keep, keep in the back mm -hmm. of your mind and, and keep an eye out on, you know. Um, some, uh, some other stuff, uh, CRISPR technology, so gene editing. Um, this technology has basically got the ability to, to cure some of the world's like biggest, biggest um, killers and and problems. I mean, right. you know, there's there's a company I looked at the other day that's um, working on a cure for blindness. Um, there's people working on cures for dwarfism. There's people working on, you know, uh, all, all sorts of stuff. Um, really, really interesting space. Uh, so yeah, and, and and that's that's a pretty hyped up sector at the moment. So you know, maybe maybe worth keeping an eye on, but not investing in yet. Um, hydrogen is, is, is kind of split into multiple sectors. You've got the people that produce hydrogen. You've got the companies that are building vehicles that use hydrogen. You've got people that are building power plants and battery storage that essentially is using hydrogen. Right. You've got the shipping industry, which is going to use hydrogen. Um, you know, so like you can, you can kind of dive down like this, this tree of, uh, of, of kind of how these things play out. Um, so yeah, there's, there's well, a lot to look at. A lot so to look at. What, 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 see, I've been very curious recently and I've been looking into nuclear energy and mm. uh, obviously everyone's talking about hydrogen, always talking about energy. And obviously, in my opinion, nuclear is probably going to be one of the, the cleanest ways to actually create hydrogen itself, especially the amount that we're talking about that everyone seems to be wanting to move to. Thoughts? Um, I think wind and solar companies are the best bet um, and actually right. natural gas companies as well. Right. So um, most of the hydrogen that's produced right now is um, kind of nicknamed blue hydrogen because it's it's not green, right? It's it's not actually really renewable. It's it's basically taking natural gas and then converting that into hydrogen. Um, 
But uh, we're moving towards a, a world where we have we, we've deployed solar and wind so much that we're producing an awful lot of it, and we have nowhere to store it, right? And, yeah. and you have companies like Tesla and stuff that are working on big battery storage solutions, um, but they're just not really shootable yet. So the the kind of cool thing about um, about hydrogen is that you can you can make it out of water, um, and so you're you're getting projects in Australia that's uh, those are project that is just absolutely vast. I think it was a uh, five gigawatt hour um, solar farm. And out of that, two gigawatt hours of it is dedicated to producing hydrogen. Um, so so I, think, um, I think those industries are, are looking better in terms of like the, the cost benefit because the way it's working at the moment, so California is a great example. Mm. In California, they produce so much solar that they're paying the states next door to them to take that power away from them because they can't do anything with it. So they're literally paying other people to do it. If you're a hydrogen company, you can just go and set yourself up in California and say, pay me, I'll take that power, I'll, I'll make hydrogen out of it, and then I'll go and sell the hydrogen as well. So you're making profit by taking power, and you're making profit by selling hydrogen. Right. Um, and and you, you're killing two birds with one stone. And then when those companies exist, you then get the companies that are up a power plant actually uses the hydrogen that's being produced um, to actually produce more energy when the sun isn't shining. Um, that's, that's the way I see it. I think nuclear is actually more of a, a good option in regions of the world that are much more inaccessible, um, where you don't have wind and solar easily available, and it's hard to get hydrogen there. Um, that's, that's where I think nuclear has, has got more of a chance. Um, so yeah, it, it's worth looking at, if, if you're investing in nuclear companies, it's worth looking at like, where are they actually building this stuff? Because if they're building it anywhere that's, you know, near the equator, then I think they're going to be out running out of business in the next few years. Um, yeah. What do you think about wind, wind companies in and around the regions of obviously England and, uh, uh, EU, because obviously we're a little island, we're getting shot left, right, silly boy, <laughs> wind, right? <laughs> Yeah, uh, the UK is in an incredible position um, for wind um, and Europe generally. So most of the big wind companies are based out of Europe. Um, so Vestas Wind Systems and Orsted Energy are my Orsted. two favorites. Um, uh, Siemens Gamsa Renewable Energy as well, SGRE is their ticker. Um, they're, they're really good. Uh, I would be looking more towards offshore wind at this point. If, if, you, if you look at, um, if you're on a company's website, right, you can literally go and see the products that they offer. Um, the problem with onshore wind is that you've got to transport the parts of the turbine to the place where you're building that wind turbine. And so you're restricted on how big you can make them. Um, and wind turbines essentially scale incredibly well. Um, so really, it's offshore wind is where, where the big money is. Um, and that's where you want to be looking. Um, and yeah, so th those three companies that I mentioned are, are all working on big offshore wind projects. Some of them are working with hydrogen as well. Um, so I, I think those are, those are good companies to look at. Do you see, do you see if, for example, obviously in, in space travel and, and obviously what everyone's trying to do, and you've got obviously uh, S, S, SPCE, right? So obviously yeah. Virgin Galactic, right? That's, yeah. How do you see companies like that favoring in the future? Because I know that up from Shamath has got a huge following now from Twitter, but obviously being involved with all yeah. this. And, and I think everyone's kind of jumping on that. What do you think? Uh, first of all, he's like probably my favorite person in like the investing space. I absolutely love him. Um, he, call, he calls out King like, you know, Yeah, yeah. He 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 calls out the the rubbish that's happening. He invests in really cool stuff. He seems like a really chilled guy. Yeah, I, I love the stuff that he's involved in. But I think people are forgetting um, the companies that really have served at the aerospace industry and uh, even just the the aeroplane industry for a very long time, right? Because there's not that much of a difference, right? If you're a company that build planes, you can probably build a rocket. Um, and if you go and look at the valuations of companies like Airbus and companies like Boeing, they have been decimated by uh, COVID. So we're, we're in a situation where, um, where I think actually, when you look at the valuations, it might be worth taking a punt on one of them and thinking, you know what, maybe in five years time, they might start working on rockets. Or, or even if they don't, they might start supplying some of the stuff that goes towards building those rockets. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's, um, that's a cool route to take. Uh, it, that's, that's kind of my opinion on that sector. But it is, a, it is another right. booming sector worth looking yeah, at. I think, I think Boeing already aids quite a lot of uh, projects yeah. in regards to NASA and stuff. I yeah, mean, I've got quite do. a big yeah. position in, uh, in Boeing. I'm quite lucky. I took quite a big position in quite a lot of my companies. So I'm quite, <laughs> quite low. So I'm going to yeah. hold some of those for a while. Do you, 
What what do you think the first things to recover will be? Do you think it will be the the the, the airplane sector? I think everyone's a little bit deluded in the fact that they think we can just teleport around as soon as all this happens, yeah. and and and, and, yeah. and plane travel is not a thing anymore. <laughs> yeah, I I think it's going to be interesting um, because we've also got you know with the Biden administration coming in and stuff, we're getting this kind of pressure from from companies to go green, and the aerospace engine industry has got the biggest challenge with that, right? Like they're already trains mainly run on electricity around Europe. Um, so, you know, the Eurostar and stuff. So carbon emissions are really low. So like that's the way I'm kind of looking at it is in terms of like what happens if there's a carbon tax in five years, you know? Um right. is is that gonna kill the air the air like the the kind of airspace industry um as soon as it's just recovered. <laughs> um yeah. and and there is potential for it too. Um so that's that's kind of one thing that I'm looking at as a risk in that sector. Um, but I think really, uh, if if you're investing in that sector, you've got to think about um, you know who's actually really adding value and who's who's really got a sustainable business model, right? If there's a company that's doing short haul flights from Manchester to to London, right, then they're going to be disrupted as soon as HS2 is finished, and they're going to be disrupted um, by any investments in in greener alternatives. Um, right. And their margins are already very low, right? They turn around those planes super quickly. So long haul is what I would probably be looking at in in that space. Um, if I were to invest in it, uh, but but I think um, yeah, I I actually think probably the safer play in terms of the recovery. Um, sorry to like reinterrupt you. I think for the, for the recovery, I think um, probably restaurants is a good bet. Um, and, and honestly, taxi services and stuff, Uber, Lyft, you know, right. um, they've been hit by this pretty hard. And and you know, hotel chains, um, Booking dot com, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, that's that's an interesting place to look at. Yeah, booking's a good one. I'm 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 really interested into trying to get into Airbnb, but the price is just a little bit what I don't want to pay at the moment. So I'm I'm trying to hope for their next two quarters, obviously, to be down, and then I'm looking for a better entry spot. I invested in Airbnb about uh, four days ago. So oh, we took a position. What what was that? What one eighty? Yeah. Maybe. And what was what? What was it at one eighty? Um, hold on, let me check. I'll check for you. Uh, I think I'm actually seeing a very small loss on it at the moment. Um, yeah, I'm basically break even on it. So yeah, one eight one eighty one. It's my open. One. So yeah, I've, um, I, I'm I'm bullish on it. I'm bullish I've, on it. I've got a position in uh, uh, one twenty, but it's not going to go to one twenty again. But I've got a position <laughs> waiting to fill at one twenty. If anyone wants to sell, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not selling you mine for that. <laughs> I, I think it's obviously such a for the next probably the next five years. It's going to be one of the the, the biggest stocks in my opinion. Yep. Yeah, so. One of the most interesting things about Airbnb is that um, obviously the hospitality industry got hit really hard by COVID. Airbnb have actually handled that entire situation really well. If you look at their balance sheet, they're very, very healthy. But if you look at the bookings on their website, they've, they've still like got a really high occupancy rate. Um, right. And the reason for that is that all these people that are self-isolating with their granny or whatever, they've just gone and booked out a cheap Airbnb um, that's just down the road from them and they're living there. Right. They're just living there. <laughs> um, so so even though they're not going on holiday, right, these these um, apartments are being repurposed and, and people are booking them to just use it as an office, right? They miss the commute to work or whatever. They want to be somewhere else because everyone's working from home now and everyone's tr- trying to shout down their computer over Zoom in the same room. So people are booking Airbnbs to do it. Um, and that's part of the reason that I went for it. You know, booking.com and, and hotels don't have that same... Uh, that same advantage really because they're just not priced competitively enough but Airbnb is seeing a, a lot of people use it in this way and it's helping them I think sail through this relatively unscathed compared to their competitors um, yeah which yeah no I totally do you know what I also like about about Airbnb I just love companies that help make the normal person money yeah yeah absolutely I love yeah. that I think it's so scalable and the more you can give people money the more they want to use it Right. The less greedy you are as a company, the bigger it becomes in that sector. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Fiverr is another good example of that, you know. Fiverr, um, yeah. you got people people living in, in India who would normally charge, you know, a few pounds uh, for, for a day's work of uh, graphics design work. And all of a sudden, they're selling to people in the UK for 10x that amount. And, you know, they're using that money to go out and improve their community. Like, it's a, it's a feel-good investment um, right. at the end of the day. Like, you know that... Uh, if if you're you're essentially helping you're helping other regions of the world kind of help develop, um, it's it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I like it. Yeah, I'll Airbnb that. similar. Airbnb. Yeah, I've actually been using Fiverr for the last ten years. <laughs> <laughs> so I've yeah. got sm- I've got a small position in it as well, just because of that reason. I've used it the whole time. What yeah. what 
what do you think about uh, Walgreens and um, Wynn and hotel chains like that? Yeah, uh, Walgreens. Uh, Walgreens is pretty popular, and, and CVS uh, pretty popular um, uh, trades at the moment. Uh, they're pretty uh, healthy uh, companies in terms of like value plays, uh, stuff stuff like that. I mean, even Walmart, Walmart. You Walmart. know, like these these are really good, safe investments, um, especially if you want to build like a dividend portfolio. Um, and and your viewers may be like wondering, you know, like uh, you know, why would I even build a dividend portfolio? The bigger you get, the more money you've got, the the more you're going to want a stable income and a portfolio that doesn't move around so much. And and that's what um, those kind of companies can offer you. Um, so yeah, like I think uh, even if you're going for a risky portfolio, you need to have a few a few companies in there like that that are a bit kind of slow and steady and safe. Like Disney is another one. Um, they're a pretty safe company. Uh, you know they're they're already at scale. Oh, I love Still Disney. Growth. So D- Disney I've is got, super bullish. Super I've bullish. got a huge position. Well, I've got ten million pound position in in Disney on, but I got in at one hundred and twenty two. Yeah. So that's 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 uh, that's nice. Yeah, I've I've been in and out of Disney quite a bit. Um, yeah, I've I don't have very much at the moment, but I, I want to build more. Yeah, the uh, I, I know I'm, I'm reading a few things on Seeking Alpha, and I agree with some of the some of the things. But the thing is, with Disney, they own the whole entire kid market, and they can recreate films. For example, um, uh, what, it's got like mad. What's that film called? Uh, Frozen, right? Yeah. If you can recreate a film as as high grossing as Frozen like now then and they can keep recreating it they're just they're on to an absolute winner they're on all the the kid market they've got everyone's going to continue to have kids for the rest of their life right they've got the yeah. hotel chains they've got uh, parks they've got obviously the streaming service now which wasn't built into the actual price when i purchased yeah um and obviously you're going to see the uh obviously i looked on google trends i love to look at google trends i love to check alexa and i like to check out uh, how, how yeah. everything's going and I've looked at them versus Netflix and they're following the exact same trend. So if Netflix is doing well, Disney Plus is doing well. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, pretty much with everything you've said. Uh, D- Disney is just a, a super, super good company. And and like people underestimate the value of IP, right? right? The fact that they own Star Wars and stuff like there's merchandise deals, there's everything, you know? Um, people, they use it in their theme parks. Um, yeah. and, and you can't forget that, right? Like I own a uh, position in Six Flags, right? But one of the biggest risks of Six Flags is that people want more and more and more of an experience. Six Flags yeah. makes brilliant roller coasters, but there's no theme, you know, compared to what Disney has. Disney can theme stuff and have like little R two D twos walking around and stuff, um, and and you know it's hard to compete with that. How how do you compete with that? Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, and and you made a really good point on the um, on the uh, the content, the films and stuff, right? Because the the cool thing about making that, and you'll pro- I guess you'll understand this, since, you know, uh, with, with a YouTube channel and stuff, and in the influencer space, like once you've made some content, you can monetize that content for a really long time. Because people, there are people having kids now that are still going to go and show their kids like, you know, Sleeping Beauty or, or whatever, like these yeah. films that were made like 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And they're still making money for the likes of, uh, for the likes of Disney. So, um, you know, there's something to be said about that. And, and this is why Netflix was, was continually like undervalued for so long. People just mm-hmm. kept underestimating them, right? They're spending all of this money making all this, this, this content and people are like, wow, you're just throwing money away. But they're not because they've got that content for Forever, you know, it's theirs. They can they can keep it on there forever, and it gives more and more and more content for people to watch. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting to think about stuff like that. I think. And if you have never been to Orlando Disney World, I mean Disneyland, then come on, Disney World. Sorry, yeah, come on, <laughs> a- 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 Avatar World. <laughs> I've not been there. Oh, you need to go. <laughs> oh, sorry. If, you, if you want, if you've never been at at all, no. I've been, wow. I've been to, I've been to Disneyland Paris like when I was like twelve or something. And, no, that's yeah. absolute B tech stuff. That is, cool. <laughs> you need to get yourself on the next floor as soon as possible, straight to Disneyland in uh, Orlando, Florida, and it will be honestly the best place you've ever been. The most, ma- it's magical. Everything about it. Do you know what I mean, I'm 28 and I'm talking like this about Disney. <laughs> that is exactly why I'm invested. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you definitely need I, to. Go. I get it. I get it. And I don't know if you knew as well, what Disney have done is they've taken a lot of their merchandise too out of the parks and they've put it into like gas stations in America. Mm. Yeah, so, I can believe it. Yes. This, the, and this is, this is what I mean. Like when you own an IP, there are just opportunities everywhere. Like, you know, mm. don't forget about games and stuff as well. We could see a Frozen game come out mm. on, on the new PlayStation or whatever. Like, and, and they license it off. They take zero risk. They just get easy money. Um, right. 
And, you know, it's, it's the same for all of their content, Star Wars, a whole lot. And we haven't even touched on VR yet about obviously virtual reality and they could use yeah. all that that content within virtual reality with a game and sit kids down, stick a headset on them. And then, yeah, I mean, they could build a social network for all we know. They've, they've, they've got so much, like, as you say, right, they're in the kids market. They could literally make a social network for kids if they wanted to at this point. Um, yeah. They've got the money, they've got they've got the audience, like there's, there's you know, and they've got a lot of smart people. They're going to be looking at all of these opportunities. Um and weighing up, you know, if they think it's worth it or not. They just signed the Black Panther director, right? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, so the, so the guy, I think he, I haven't actually not, I've actually not watched Black Panther, but Disney just Good signed show. the Black Panther director. Uh, Disney Black um, he's made a lot of good films. He's got some films on Netflix that are really good, actually, that director. My portfolio consists of... Hang on, let me stop recording. Actually, it doesn't really matter. But, uh, uh, my, yeah, mine consists of quite a lot of different things, to be fair. Um, Amazon. I've got £10 million in Amazon. Again, I think it's going to be... When the earnings come out today, I think it should be up quite a lot. Uh, mm. Disney. Hang on, let me let me pull it up, because you know, you know what it's like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> hang on a sec. Uh, it's a, it's a, it gets addictive trading stocks, doesn't it? I don't know how long you've been doing it for, but you, you start to just like, I don't know, you just care so much about these companies. Do you know what? That's one of the reasons I had to sell my MC position. It was a tiny position for me, right? But I couldn't sleep. I could not sleep. I had, an, yeah. I had anxiety, not because not because it was going to go down or anything, just because I was so obsessed with staring at it. Yeah. I thought, I've got, yeah. I need, to, it was a perfect time to get out, but, I, but one of those reasons too. So I've got a, uh, a position in Nike, uh, Boeing, uh, Facebook, I feel it's some divide, but it gets a lot of a lot of stick. But from an ads point of ads view, perspective, yeah, churn so much money. All of our companies have been built on ads, so I just can't I can't forget it. Disney, absolutely love Airbus. Uh, I've got a tiny position in Delta, but I'm talking about I, I bought into Delta at like 24. So mm. Amazon, Carnival, Royal Caribbean. Again, I bought at these at like 12, and yeah. and and. and, and but 45, so I got in quite low on those. Boohoo, love Boohoo. Yeah, Boohoo's not on Ethoro, right? Boohoo's a nice one. Love, love Boohoo. And Boohoo obviously just bought Debenham's IP for the online only, which started. Oh, did out. they? I yeah, so, so, so Boohoo is the own, probably one of the only UK companies that I will continue to invest in. Yeah. Uh, I think it, you know, this probably could be a little bit of a better entry point. Um, I got in around 280, but I feel like Boohoo for the future is, is, is massive. Mm, it's interesting. So yeah. they, they, they are one of the, okay, from an entrepreneur's perspective, everything's correct. I've got friends that have built companies now and Boohoo are knocking on their door, early doors, recognizing how good they are. Other people don't see that. So from a board perspective, because I like to invest not just in the company, also in yeah, the people. Yeah, the team, yeah. Their team is phenomenal. They control wow. the whole market. So that's really yeah. that's really interesting, actually. That they were spot, spotting um, spotting all the kind of the up and coming uh, clothing startups and stuff. That's pretty cool. Got a position in Apple. Yeah, um, I like Apple. Safe yeah. bet. Shopify. Our company yeah. was completely built on Shopify. If we didn't have Shopify, we'd be probably nowhere right now. So perfect. Win Resorts, uh, Nokia, Square, yeah. Etsy. Square and Etsy. I love Etsy. Absolutely love Etsy. So good. I'm going to talking take... about our team. The team at Etsy is phenomenal. Love right. them. Love them. Right. Walgreens, uh, Fiverr. Yeah, Fiverr's good. Tattoo Chef. Yeah, I've got some Tattoo Chef. Uh, Affirm. It's a payment gateway. Oh, I don't know them actually. So Affirm and Afterpay, uh, the the t the two buy now pay pay letters, similar to mm, Klarna, okay. but obviously Klarna's not public, right? Klarna yeah, I don't like the... Klarna. They denied me. But they they did not. Oh, I really? got nine hundred ninety nine credit score. I've had it for my entire <laughs> life. They fucking denied me. I tried to buy my Peloton, and I'm like, well, I don't want to be paying in. Like you know, if I can buy this right. at zero percent interest for like fucking two years, then why wouldn't I? It's a right. two and a half grand bike, you know. And then they <laughs> fucking denied me for it. I tweeted. I I tweeted them. I was like, what are you doing? Uh, guaranteed money for you <laughs> like fuck's sake oh, angry mate do you, know, do you know what do you know what it was it was it was just five risk score on Itoro that put them up <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe it was maybe it was oh that's great so Affirm obviously they've only just IPO'd I believe the the guy that founded Affirm is also the part founder of PayPal ah interesting right so he's good again after pay uh, that went down actually in the pandemic to uh, eight I think it's eight uh, uh, Australian dollars. It's now at 140 or 50. 
absolute 10 bagger 20 bagger what it's gonna it's gonna it's, it's massive it is it, it probably is overvalued at the moment well, it definitely is overvalued but the problem is is there isn't no competition mm. as a, for a public company the only one that just launched was a firm and i mean they rpo'd at a stupid stupid number <laughs> fucking hell i'm on i'm on rpo something me and you will have to get together and start rpoing <laughs> yeah uh yeah m phase m phase yeah i like m phase Dropbox, again, only a small position in Dropbox, but great balance sheet. I, f- yeah, I feel I'm like I'm not they... sure about Dropbox. I, I've always just kind of, it's, it's a weird one. They always look really like undervalued, but then they never seem to deliver on it. Uh, right, right. Well, let's see on this. Let's see what happens in these earnings. But I'm hoping that someone acquires Dropbox realistically. I'm hoping that Amazon buy it. Yeah, that's not a bad shout, actually. Yeah, and Amazon's a good, good pick for that as well. But yeah, that's not a bad shout. I hadn't really thought that's, about uh, that position. That's what I'm thinking. It's a it's a safe little slow burner. I don't really see it yeah. devaluing. Um, and I, I'm just hoping for someone to come and pick it up. Yeah. And that's it, really. I mean, I am looking at a few other companies. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Alibaba, too. Yeah. Yeah. I like Alibaba. Very undervalued at the moment, I think. Maybe Absolutely. I and, I, and I I bought in, I bought, I picked up uh, a two and a half million in it. So I think that was around eight. Um, ooh, what was it? About 114,000 shares or 90,000 shares, something like that. I bought that at 242 just before Jack Ma decided to walk yeah, back I into know. a fucking office. <laughs> where was where was he? Fuck's sake. I don't know. I don't know <laughs> what he was up to, but. Yeah, fucking crazy, crazy. Now, I've been holding on to Alibaba for a while. I like Tencent as well. Tencent's another one I like from China. Tencent. Uh, is Tencent yeah. a symbol, JD? No. JD is different. different. Yeah. JD is different. What do you think about JD? Um, I don't know. I've never really liked JD that much. Um, I don't know if it's just because I think they're a bit boring. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Like, I, I find it very hard to invest in companies that I don't find interesting. And yeah, like... I like I like the kind of um, enablers of e-commerce and stuff, like, like Shopify and Etsy. Um, right. But I don't really like just straight up uh, e-commerce, you know, I, I traded Amazon quite a bit over the years, and uh, I think Jumia is interesting um, and stuff. But yeah, no, JD, I've just never got into them. I don't know what it is. I just can't, I just don't like them for some reason. <laughs> like, there's nothing, there's no yeah, real good reason yeah. behind it. I'm just, uh, yeah. I see a lot of hedge funds holding them. I haven't invested myself, but mm. so. Yeah, I mean, I think the Chinese market generally is just massively undervalued at the moment. You know, the the whole like kind of backlash on on them from the US with the trade mm. war and then because of uh, COVID and like the West generally is kind of like, you know, very anti-China at the moment. But I think people forget how big the market in China is, you know, and also China is like, like Chinese companies are being used in the entire Southeast Asia region. If you look at, you go and look up like the fastest growing um, countries in the world in terms of like GDP and stuff, it's like Indonesia, the Philippines, like mm. everywhere around the Malaysia, Vietnam, all these companies, all these countries that are around China and they're all using like Alibaba services and Baidu services and, and what have you. So yeah, I think um, I think that's uh, as like in terms of like a geographical region, like that's that's where the money is, I think at the moment. Yeah, like you said, a lot of people are scared. Well, do you know what I'm trying to? I'm try- I want to get into the in- I want to get into the Indian market. Yeah, the Indian market looks really good. I, I mean, it's 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 diff- it's difficult to get exposure to some of these markets. I mean, you know, I'd, I'd love to get exposure to all of those markets I just mentioned as well, like mm. Vietnam, uh, Taiwan. Like, there's some good companies in those markets, but um, yeah, Etoro doesn't offer them. But there are some good ETFs that give you exposure though. If um, right. If you, do, if you don't want to do the research. I mean, that's the other thing is, um, you know, I'm very used to looking at companies that are filing their, their quarterly earnings and stuff with the SEC, right? I'm, I'm used to that. And you go and look at Chinese companies, and it's just a nightmare to find all the information you want. Um, so I can, I can imagine that it's probably going to be worse for a lot of other countries as well. So, um, yeah. yeah. I'm with might, H- might, might be easier to just use an ETF or something. Yeah, yeah, potentially. Yeah, I, I, I've to be fair, I'm with HSBC and they execute. I'll tell them what I want to execute their trades, and they'll execute it. But they also give me loads of research if I want it. So if I want if I want research PDFs on on, um, they'll leave you use like a third party that they use. Obviously, HSBC, one of the biggest banks in yeah, the world. Yeah. They'll pull some really good research from like the Indian markets or whatever type of market I want. Wow. That's which cool. is um which is pretty cool. So what I'll probably do is uh, I'll see if I can get them to uh, get me a few things together, especially regarding like the Indian market and stuff. And I'll uh, I'll yeah. try to share I'll share it with you. Yeah, a lot a lot of lot of good um, internet companies in India as well, um, internet based companies and stuff. I mean, like those markets are the growth markets, definitely. Definitely. Mm. Yeah, I'd be curious to see it. Definitely, I'd love to see what kind of research they 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 give you. That's really cool. 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, I asked them to send me a few stocks that they thought was going to, you know, would all be decent picks, and they sent me a nice, a good list that was that was pretty good. Uh, again, all all down to exactly what I would have picked anyway. So it was, <laughs> it was good that we we're on the same page. But I'm like similar to I'm I'm like you really. I like to invest for the long term. I look at I, mm. I'm not interested in going too. You can, as you said, you can go too far into looking into certain things regarding the company. At the end of the day, is it going to be in five years? Do you really yeah. love the company? And it's that's it's pretty much that simple. As long as it's not going to go bankrupt. Yeah, yeah. It's it's all about the product. You know, I always start with the product. Like, look at the product. Like, you know, solar panels, right? I got some solar panels stuck right. on my house. And, you know, so I spent ages looking at them all. And I realized that there's just one company that is just better than everyone else at solar panels. And it's SunPower. They they just build the best panels, full stop. Right. Like, if if you want good quality, I mean, you know, they're, they're probably the most expensive as well, right? But they're but they they warrant it, right? Like, you know, they're, they're really rock solid. Um, and so I was like, yeah, interesting, you know? And, and that's how I learned about solar edge. That's how I learned about Enphase, you know? Um, it was just from researching it to get solar put on my own house. <laughs> like, yeah. It's, it's kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy. Well, Tesla solar panels on, uh, I, I, I don't know if you watch anyone on, on uh, YouTube called Meet Kevin. Uh, no, I don't think I've watched them. No. Okay, yeah, meet Kevin. So he does quite a lot of, of things, and he's just got uh, he's getting M phase solar panels put on his house, and uh, he also had Tesla out on some of his other houses. And what they do as well is they also try and make margin on your roof, so they'll they'll offer mm. to do the to change your whole roof as well. So yeah. say a normal contractor might charge ten thousand pounds, they're actually charging like twenty thousand pounds. They're making massive margin, and then they're trying to get it really close to like having a full roof of solar yeah. panels. Yeah, yeah, the the tes- Tesla roof stuff is really interesting, um, but they're taking so long to do it. You know, part of part of the reason I was bullish on Tesla like three years ago is the Tesla roof stuff. I was like, "Fuck, this is cool, um, really interesting." Because if you're building a building from scratch, and this is where the real market is, is new buildings. If you're building a building from scratch and you get to choose between between a normal roof with solar panels slapped on top or a Tesla roof, which is basically both combined, yeah, um, it's a no brainer. You know, the second one's just a a ridiculous amount of money cheaper but they've just not managed to like deploy it at scale yet and you know it's annoying you know i yeah. want them to because because uh i think the market for it would be huge um what's i forgot to ask on the disney's perspective what's your price target for disney in the last in the next year yeah so i don't really do price target so i think price yeah. targets are overrated um <laughs> yeah. the, the reason i don't do it is because the market moves around too much it depends mm. what everything else is doing you know um like if, if netflix came out tomorrow and said they're opening a theme park and they've you know, like if they start competing on Disney's turf or something, then you probably see Disney drop a bit. Um, maybe unnecessarily, but um, so so I don't like price price targets for that reason. But for for me, I just look at it as in terms of like you know, compared to where else I could put my money at the moment, and like my confidence in in it in terms of risk, and my confidence in it in terms of like you know making beating the Nasdaq um, or the S and P, and I think it's pretty likely to beat the S and P. Are very likely to beat the S&P and pretty likely to beat the Nasdaq right. while while also offering me dividends um, and, and also offering me exposure to a different market. So it's helping kind of like lower my overall risk, my portfolio. Like, I don't know, that's that's the way I kind of look at it. Um, and it, it, it's more a case of like, you know, reanalyzing it every three or six months or whatever and being like, do I still think that they're good? And, you know, with, with Disney, like you said earlier, right, they're going to be here in five years' time. They're mm-hmm. still they're going to keep turning out. So probably the answer to that question is always going to be yes. So the only thing really that then is going to change my mind and make me think maybe I should, you know, drop a few shares of this is either if I see a really good opportunity elsewhere right. or, or a big threat to them or the, the share price has just run really far. And I'm like, you know what? This is looking a bit a bit overvalued. Like you look at the charts and you compare it to the price earnings ratio and stuff like mm. that with other uh, their competitors, and you think, okay, maybe this is uh, a a bit top heavy now. Maybe it's too popular. Maybe everyone's in it. You know, right? That's it, the way I look at it. Another thing that I also like. I don't know if you've actually got Disney Plus, have you? Uh, I don't have Disney Plus. No, you're not even a Disney fan. <laughs> <laughs> My girlfriend loves them. <laughs> uh, so, 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 so Disney, Disney Plus at at the moment in time. So when they first launched, they had great content. They had like the making of Frozen Two and things like that. Mm. And recently, it's been it's been terrible. And they're still growing the platform. Is what I'm getting at, right? The second yeah. they actually start competing with like Netflix or any other type of movie, but when they start launching their movies on there, there's like a buy service, so you don't have to go to the cinema, maybe things like that. I believe that once they up their content even more, it's going to absolutely rock it. They also own Hulu, right? Which is another streaming service. Yeah. They own, they own that partly with Comcast. Yeah, Comcast Comcast looks like a good investment at the moment, actually. 
think yeah. it's like a really good investment. Um, I'm, I'm not sure on it because uh, you know I feel bad about investing in a company, <laughs> the company that offers such shocking internet service to, a, to the the Americans. Sky. But uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, but um, yeah, as an investment, they look really appealing at the moment as well. Yeah. Well, well, they also own Sky, right? And that's also shocking for the UK people. Yeah, well, yeah, true, yeah. So, so they've got double shocking. But yeah, no, I like Comcast. I think their, their, their PE is around like eight or nine or something. Yeah, yeah. Quite low. Whereas obviously people are investing in Disney at what, maybe a 36 at the moment. But Yeah, worth, I mean, I think it. Roku's an interesting kind of play in that general space as well. Um, going, for, they're, You know, they're kind of approaching it from a different angle, right? Like they don't have their own service, but they provide mm. everyone else's service. Right through them and their their technology and stuff like you know people think oh it's just a Chromecast you mm. know but but they missed a bit uh, of working with the TV manufacturers right like you right. know they're, they're building like a standardized interface across all TVs and also you don't need a fucking you don't need a Google account you don't need a Facebook account you don't need like there's no account mm. and like people underestimate how valuable that is these days like you got an old granny you try teaching her how to get on Netflix oh my days good luck mm. give her a Roku you know she's sorted it's easy. Oh. Well, with with all the new, uh, well, with all the new Samsung, uh, what what's what's Rakuten? Is that the same thing? Oh, I, no. Oh, no, it's totally different. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say because I've got a, a remote here, obviously for all the new Samsung TVs, and they've got yeah. a, one button press Netflix, Amazon Prime, yeah, Rakuten TV, whatever that is. But yeah, yeah, I think I I think that's more popular in like Europe, uh, Rakuten stuff. Right. But, yeah, that's that's another streaming service. Um, I've never really watched it. I don't know much about it. So that's good. Well, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I appreciate everything you've done. So coming on here, talking to him, <laughs> talking to me. I know you're busy. I know you love your day trades. Uh, and I know you said you, you've got to go into what? Uh, UPS earnings call? Yeah, UPS earnings call pre-market. Um, I think it's in about half an hour or so. So see how they've done. Uh. <laughs> do you think, what do you, what's your consensus? Um, you know what? I'm not really too sure. I'm just pretty confident that. Uh, you, so I, I bought into them a while ago, um, and I was just confident that over over the holiday season, you know, they're going to see like record levels of parcel delivery. Um, and as long as they can handle that scale, um, then they're in a good position. And and this is actually also ties into like the electric vehicles and uh, stuff like that as well. You know. UPS is uh, spending a lot of money to look into um, these kind of vehicles. And if you can save even just like, you know, 5% on your fuel bill across across a company of that size, you know, that's a big difference uh, to the books. So UPS is a long-term play for me, really. But um, yeah, I felt like at Christmas, uh, they would do pretty well from from just deliveries. Is DHL public? Oh, uh, yeah, DHL is public, I think. What are your thoughts on DHL? Um, the, the two that I like the most are FedEx and UPS. Um, those, those are the ones I like most. Uh, I just feel like they've got the strongest brands and stuff as well. Um, right. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, logistics companies are difficult. Uh, they, are, they are difficult to value because, um, especially because, you know, they actually fluctuate quite a lot depending on like the price of oil and stuff as well because they rely on, you know, fuel so much. Right. Um, so there's 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 quite a lot to look into in those companies, but the, the two that I think are the best valued, or that I did think were the best valued when I looked at this space, were FedEx and UPS. So those those are what I have positions in currently. Right. Yeah. We we used to use DHL and Dutch Post, obviously Deutsche Post quite a lot um, from a lot of our companies, and they've been phenomenal to us and phenomenal service. The only issue I have is I just don't like their branding. I just think. That yeah. Well, I agree. Horrendous. I actually agree. Yeah. But maybe maybe they like it more in Europe. It's, you know, European company, I guess. Maybe we just don't get it. We're too, uh, we're too like America. Yeah. We, we like the bling, you know. <laughs> <laughs> possibly, possibly, yeah. yeah, possibly. Well, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And then where can people copy? Well, obviously people can't copy you, but where can people follow you? Yeah, so um, if you head on to eToro, you can obviously find me. My name on there is uh, Jay Nemesis. Um, my name is everywhere actually is Jay Nemesis so Twitter uh, I'm on Twitter all of the time I absolutely love Twitter um, I'm on uh, on LinkedIn uh, on you know everything Discord you name it I'm there uh, search Jay Nemesis and you'll find me but eToro is where my portfolio is even if you can't copy me you can still see my portfolio if you're curious and you want to see you know what I'm holding then you can head there and you can see it right cool Thank you very much. If you just wait there, Jay, we'll uh, just have a little chat after, if that's all right. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> top man, top man. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.